So now I'd like to introduce Jeff Keel, a senior scientist at NCAR. Jeff has worked here for 30, 36 years, and he's currently the section head of the climate change research section. Jeff received the, the AGU Climate Communication Prize in 2012. He has doctorate degrees in both atmospheric science and psychology, and is interested in how to better communicate climate science to society. Jeff has studied numerous topics related to climate science, including how Earth's past climate can inform us about the future. Please join me in welcoming Jeff, and we'll have Q&A and discussion after his talk. Thanks, Becca. Well, it is an honor to uh, present at this uh, auspicious occasion. I think it's a great idea that the Smithsonian and UCAR are joining together to convey uh, messages about and science, carry out science and convey messages about this extremely important uh, issue of climate change. And so I've chosen to talk today about the importance of the science, but also the challenges that we all face uh, in communicating the science to the public. Uh, I know a lot of you in the audience uh, participate in communicating this science uh, constantly, and I'm sure you'll uh, resonate with uh, a number of the things that I'm going to say today. Let me also just point out, I was telling Harold that I grew up just north of uh, the Smithsonian. As a kid, one of the big treats was to drive south and spend a, a Sunday or a Saturday in downtown Washington going to the Smithsonian. So uh, I'm sure going to those exhibits played an influence on me ending up as a scientist and standing up here speaking to you. So the outline of what I want to cover tonight, today is, uh, first of all, why climate communication is important. Briefly, something on that. Then I'm going to give you the core concepts that I like to communicate. Uh, often, this, uh, it's stated that this is a very complex issue, and one of the difficulties in connecting people to climate change is due to the complexity of the issue. I actually take issue with that. I, I, I think the basics of this issue aren't that complex. They're fairly straightforward. And it's always good to start with the things that we uh, understand the best and give you the, the biggest picture and, and actually the most important picture of what's going on and, and how we're playing a role in that. And then the rest of the talk, as many of you know, I've been interested in this topic for a number of years looking at what are the barriers uh, that exist to communicating this issue. Uh, for many years, we worked under the so-called information deficit model, which was, well, we're just not good communicators, and if we could figure out how to convey that information uh, in, in a more uh, refined way, the public would grasp the science, and they, their awareness would be raised, and behaviors would change based on that uh, awareness. And that just isn't how communication works, uh, and I want to explore that with you. It isn't how communication works uh, around issues that are highly emotionally charged, like climate change. It works really well when scientists talk to other scientists, because we are just looking for information. Uh, and then I'll give, briefly give you some ways of breaking through some of these barriers and then summarize. So why is this important? Well, I think everyone in this room knows why it's important, but it was interesting that this weekend I was reading, I read the Guardian newspaper, and there was a report from the Davos uh, conference that was going on last weekend, and Mario Molino was asked to come to the conference. He won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his contribution in understanding humans' impact on ozone depletion, and he said that... Um, he warned that scientists need to do more to help the public understand the threat of climate change. Molina also called on fellow scientists to speak out. We in science are doing a lousy job in communicating the extent of the risks we are facing. This is actually something that uh, those of you uh, know about Naomi Oreskes' work. She's a historian of science. Naomi has been writing a number of articles, both opinion pieces and peer-reviewed journal articles on how 
scientists are failing to communicate the, the risks involved in climate change. And so this is an extremely important issue from a societal perspective that we get this message out. Do the, does the public want this information? Well, this is a poll taken a few years ago by, by the Yale group. And the question was, uh, would the public in, like more information on the issue of global warming? And you can see that uh, the combination, I need some more information, I need a lot of more information, 47% of the American public would like more information on this issue. They're, they're, so there, there's definitely a need or a desire to know more uh, about this issue. And so it's incumbent upon us uh, to provide that information in a way that uh, can be understood. There is a challenge, however. Uh, many of you know this. This is a topic, especially in the United States. It's a very difficult one to convey. This is, again, another poll, a Gallup poll, where uh, people were asked about whether the warming is caused by um, humans or it's natural. And you can see that 40% of the American public still believe that the warming that's observed is mainly due to natural causes. Whereas the scientific consensus on this is the majority of the warming is actually due to humans. So we have a long way to go to convince a substantial number of people that, uh, about the science and how we understand uh, the changes that are occurring. Another uh, topic or issue that keeps coming up is the perception of how many scientists, the, commu the scientific community, how it uh, agrees on this issue. There's been a, a number of studies surveying the scientific community asking the question, you know, is the planet warming and is most of that warming due to human activity? And 97% of the community, scientific community, is in consensus uh, around that issue, that indeed the planet's warming and humans are the, are the dominant cause for that warming. But then when you ask the public what their perception is of the scientific community, uh, you can see there's quite a spread. In fact, roughly 40 to 50% of the American public feel that there's no consensus in the scientific community on this issue. So again, it's a perception issue. The reality is uh, you know, there's a, a tremendous consensus around this issue, whereas the public's perception is that there's very little consensus in the scientific world on this issue. So these are the things that we're up against in terms of uh, communicating, connecting to the public, and convincing them, or at least um, working with them to understand uh, what the scientific community has been doing and, and what's happening in the world. So I'd like to now cover briefly the core concepts that I always like to communicate. If I'm sitting in an airplane with beside somebody and they ask me what I do, uh, if I'm at, uh, some, some people uh, defer that question, but I think it's incumbent upon us to tell people what we do, and then if they ask, um, convey some of these ideas. You can also use this with family members. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the number one thing, and by the way, all of these are based on observations or uh, a fundamental law of physics, okay? It's not based on climate models, it's not based on uh, projections, conjectures, it's hard observations and one law of physics. I often say that if you actually, if you reject the science of climate change, you've re rejected uh, quantum mechanics, you've rejected nuclear physics, and you've rejected uh, a fundamental law of the universe. So it's your choice. You can accept climate change <laughs> and, and accept all those other laws of uh, theories of physics, or you can reject climate change, and then you've rejected 80% of the physical sciences. So the first observation that's very well documented is carbon dioxide's increasing in the atmosphere, and it's been increasing uh, substantially since the Industrial Revolution. This is a, a, a series of observations put together going back to uh, 2,000 years ago. And you can see that for close to uh, 1,700 years, 
there was no change in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then once we started to dig up fossil fuels and burn them, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere started to rapidly increase. And it's increasing at a fairly uh, rapid pace, uh, an unprecedented pace, I feel, which I'll argue in a little bit. That's the first fact. The second fact, because it's always, the issue always comes up, how do you know that's due just to humans? Okay. And so scientists are very clever. Uh, we, can, we can actually, luckily nature provides us with two, at least two flavors of carbon in, in its system. There's a lighter uh, flavor of carbon and a heavier flavor of carbon. And plants, organisms, love the light flavor of carbon over the heavier flavor. So since fossil fuels are made of organisms that were buried tens to hundreds of millions of years ago, uh, they're going to favor, be uh, rich in the lighter uh, amount of carbon. And indeed, if you measure the amount of light carbon to heavy carbon, you can see that uh, this, the top figure shows you that uh, the amount of light carbon in the atmosphere uh, is, is actually increasing. There's even a simpler way to understand this. When you burn something, you use oxygen. Okay. If a volcano shoots carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's not a combustion of a product. It's just the injection of carbon right into the atmosphere. But when you burn something, you're going to use a little oxygen. And as we burn fossil fuels, we are consuming a little bit of oxygen in the atmosphere. And that's the bottom panel. You can see the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is declining. The only way you can understand that is that, uh, we, that we are burning fossil fuels. Okay. Now, not to fear, not to panic, we're not going to consume all the oxygen in the atmosphere and be oxygen starved. These are very tiny amounts. and It shows you the precision and accuracy which with scientists can develop instruments that they can actually detect that tiny reduction in oxygen as we burn more and more fossil fuels. So these are the two uh, indicators that definitively show that the increase in carbon dioxide we're observing has to be due to the burning of fossil fuels. It cannot be due to any other process. And then the other fact, which we've known for over 150 years, is uh, that carbon dioxide is a very efficient greenhouse a a gas. It, it absorbs the thermal radiation that's coming off of the surface of the planet. And the guy that uh, did the first experiments on this is an Irish scientist, Joseph, John Tyndall. And John Tyndall actually, it's very interesting, he was also a popularizer of science in London in the 1800s. He gave many popular uh, lectures at the Royal Institution in London. He would pack the house and he, would, he was sort of the uh, early Carl Sagan of uh, connecting the public to science. And this is an interesting quote. He published it in a paper in 1859. The bearing of his experiments, that is that CO2 is an efficient greenhouse gas, upon the action of planetary atmospheres is obvious. The atmosphere admits of the entrance of the solar heat, so solar radiation can get through the gases, but checks it, its exit, so it won't allow the CO2 won't allow the thermal radiation to escape to space. And the result is a tendency to accumulate heat at the surface of the planet. So since 1859, we've known that increase in carbon dioxide is going to warm the planet. And that's a very important point when you're communicating to the public. Often the public's perception is that this is a very recent scientific issue, that it's only been around for 20 or 30 years. And to actually tell people that, you know, Tyndall did his work in the 1850s, that in 1896 the first scientific calculation was done by Svante Arrhenius in Sweden, uh, that there is a long history to our scientific understanding of this issue. It's not something that scientists just dreamt up 20 years ago. And that all of those discoveries that were made 100 or more years ago have been confirmed and refined over and over. And by the way, that's something that's, that I'm beginning to finally appreciate more recently in some of the talks that I've given to the public. 
is this is not just about global warming or climate change. It's how the public perceives how science is done. There is actually a very um, poor understanding of how scientists work. I remember going to a, a talk recently where a number of the audience were very upset about this issue. They, weren't, they did not agree that humans are changing the climate system. And the argument that they kept making over and over to me in a very heated way was you scientists keep changing your story. You keep changing your story. You know, the planet's warming, but the surface temperature's not going up. And, and uh, as I tried to convey how the science, scientists came to the understanding, I realized that there is this lack of understanding of how science is done. That, you know, Galileo made some observations. And then Kepler came along and deduced certain laws about those uh, observations. And it was only until Newton came along that he could actually derive those laws that Kepler uh, deduced. And that the story wasn't even complete then. That, you know, 300 years later, Einstein came along and said, well, Newton had it just about right, but there are some small corrections that need to be made. And that's how science is done. Now, the point here is that none of those scientists after Galileo overturned or refuted his original observations. They refined and, and brought deeper understanding to them. And I think that's something that needs to be conveyed about this issue of global warming. That, we're, you know, that the work of John Tyndall has been substantiated and improved upon over the last 150 years or so. Okay, the next fact, the third fact, fourth fact, is increasing, if you increase a greenhouse gas, it's going to trap that energy and that has, energy has to go into the climate system. It can't, it can't go anywhere else. Okay, and so this is the uh, amount of energy that the heat's taking up over time. And you can see that certainly since the 1980s, there has been this upward trend in how much energy is being absorbed into the oceans. And interestingly enough, if you look at the latter part of that, it continue, it's been continuing to go up. So this so-called hiatus that, that you know, the warming has stopped, that the planet is no longer warming, is not true. Because you have to look at the whole system. You can't just look at the surface. And if you look at below the ocean surface, that's where the energy is going. And, it's, and it's, it has to do that. It has to do that because of the not next thing. So all of these are observations that I've shown you. Now we're getting to the law, and that's the law of conservation of energy. I always like to point out to audiences that unlike laws written by Congress, this cannot be changed, altered, or repealed. <laughs> the universe has given us this law, and we all have to live by it. You can't cheat this law. And so if you're going to trap energy, it has to warm the planet. This is the latest figure uh, produced by the guys, Na our colleagues at NASA GIS. This is the temperature trend up to the end of last year, just a few weeks ago. And you can see that indeed uh, everything, the planet is warming. The continents are warming faster than, this is the rate of warming. So it's temperature per decade. And you can see that the continents are warming faster than the ocean regions and that the high latitudes are warming faster than the low latitudes. By the way, all of those things were predicted by the early modeling studies that were done 30, 40 years ago. Uh, I mean, Suki Manabe's early work and Warren's early work in the late 60s and early 70s, they all predicted that this would be the pattern that you would expect from an increase in greenhouse gases. So those are the points that I really like to get across. And as I say, I always like to emphasize there's been no modeling in this, okay? Because a lot of people, they'll use that as, well, it's all based on models. And what if the models are wrong? Then you'd have to throw out your, your ideas about uh, climate change. Now, the other fact that's very important to convey is that although it's, we call it global warming and it's, you know, the focus is on temperature, that 
we all know in this room that it's not just temperature. And this is this is the you know the other evidence that you can bring into the courtroom that really nails the case for uh, the fact that it's due to increasing greenhouse gases because glaciers are melting both in mid latitudes and certainly at the poles. Uh, we're one of the, some of the more interesting signatures that we're seeing is how the biosphere, life on the planet, is actually responding. There's been really nice studies of the timing of trees blooming on the East Coast, where you see shifts in the timing of the blooming that spring is coming earlier. I mean, I'm sure you've lived on the East Coast long enough, you've probably noticed that, that cherry tree blossoming is, is occurring much earlier than it, it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. And so these are all signatures pointing to the single fact that the most comprehensive theoretical explanation for what's happening to the planet is due to the warming world, due to the increase in carbon dioxide. And that, as I showed uh, in the first two slides, especially the second slide, that that's due to us. Okay. Now, uh, the other things that are happening, of course, gets a lot of press, the sea level rise. And this is due to the fact that the ocean, the warming ocean is expanding and also the ice that's melting on continents is going, running into the oceans. So again, you get this secular increase in uh, sea level height uh, through time. There's no flattening out of it. Uh, the change is still going on. It will continue to go on as long as the planet continues to warm. It will actually go on even after the planets. If we actually can arrest the warming, it will continue because there's memory in the Earth system. And it's going to remember for a very long time what we've done to it. Um, and then the last thing that I'd like to emphasize is that we often get fixed on looking at changes in the average state of the world, of the planet. And of course, it's more than about averages, and there's a lot of research on now extremes. And this is a very nice plot that Jim Hansen and his colleagues made a, a few years ago, uh, where they essentially looked at northern hemisphere summer temperatures and took all the data for each month and plotted a, a histogram of it for the between 1951 and 1980, and it, it fits this beautiful bell curve. And then they've done this for the later decades, 80, 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 2000, 2000 to 2011. And you can see that that histogram, that distribution is shifting further and further uh, to the right. So that the probability of a warm, extreme warm events uh, to occur is increasing as we warm the planet. So it's not just that the, on average the planet's getting warmer, the extremes in temperature, the heat waves uh, that we're experiencing are intensifying, which have tremendous societal implications. <clears throat> so uh, one last point that I always like to make, and I have to sadly say that when I asked this question in my, to my scientific colleagues, uh, about 50% of them can answer the question correctly. And that is, uh, it's, you can easily show that if we were to continue burning fossil fuels at the rate that we have been burning them, and we do that for another 90 years, that the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide is going to be about 1,000 parts per million. Okay, it's an easy, if you can do the calculation for the uh, mortgage that you're paying on your house, you can do this calculation. And so the question is, when was the last time that Earth's atmosphere had 1,000 parts per million carbon dioxide in it? And the answer, I, it's here. This, uh, here's the reconstruction of atmospheric carbon dioxide using uh, geochemical data, starting, here's 5 million years ago, back to about 50 million years ago. And here's 1,000 parts per million. And so you have to go back about 35 to 40 million years before uh, the planet had that much carbon dioxide in it. So you think about this. Think about it in terms of rate. It took Earth 
about 40 million years to go from 1,000 parts per million to uh, the, roughly the present values, pre-industrial values. It's taking humans about 200 to 250 years to return it back to that state. So the rate of change that we are exacting on the planet is actually unprecedented from a geological perspective. And since life on the planet is actually very sensitive to the rate at which the system changes, probably more sensitive to the rate at which it changes than the absolutes, this has tremendous implications for uh, what's going to happen to, the, to us, and in particular the biosphere over the next 80 years. And that's the other fact. You know, when I started giving talks on climate change, I used to talk about your grandchildren, uh, you know, experiencing these changes. And now you can, you know, firmly state that, you know, any child baby that's born today has a, a very high chance of living for 80 years, at least, because the life expectancy, you know, has tr continued to increase. So a child born today is going to experience that world. It's not your grandchildren, it's your children that are going to experience that world. And the question from an ethical perspective is, what kind of a world do we want to bequeath to those children? What do we want to pass on? Do we want to pass on a world that has a thousand parts per million CO2 in it? Now, I always like to ask this question, how are you feeling? <laughs> as depressed as usual. <laughs> Any other responses? Hmm? Scared. Numb. Angry. Okay. All right. So, if I had been sitting up here, standing up here talking about dark matter, I doubt those would be the responses. Okay. So this is a very special issue. It's an issue that evokes feeling, emotion. And that's where we're going to go now. So I'm going from uh, climate scientist to psychologist now. Let me just make, switch my hands. Okay, so what are the um, barriers to getting this issue across? Well, there's the fundamental, a fundamental one, which is an educational one, basic understanding of science, which is conveyed here in this cartoon. You know, why don't the greenhouse gases escape through the o hole in the ozone layer? You know, that, that's, you know, how do we understand how the climate system works? And frankly, uh, we're not, we haven't done a great job at that. And uh, there's good news that the, the new science standards that were passed or approved at few years ago, include a module on climate and climate change. Okay. And so I'm actually working with some people in, uh, out in Berkeley uh, to help develop some modules on uh, improving under our K through 12 understanding of uh, science change. I don't want to talk about those, that topic today. I want to actually focus on these other ones, the social and cultural dimensions economic dimensions. I'm not really going to say a lot about that. I'm going to say more about the psychological dimensions. So what are the, some of the social, cultural, and economic factors? Well, there's been a tremendous amount of research over the last 10 years, last five years in particular, on the effect of value systems on our ability to take in the science of climate change. Value systems can include religious beliefs. For some, uh, listening to the science, in particular, agreeing with the fact that humans have the ability to change Earth's climate, is a it goes in direct conflict with their religious belief. I mean, uh, James Imhoff just recently said, only God has the power to change uh, the planet's climate. So that's a religious belief that is challenged by the science. This is the same issue that uh, people who teach evolution uh, face. It can also be other value systems, as we'll look at in a moment. It can be a threat to independent agency. In, 
particular, this problem, as you all know, is large. We, if we're going to actually solve it, we're going to have to mitigate or reduce the emissions of carbon into the atmosphere. That's not going to be done in, at, on an individual level. It's something that has to be done at a national and international level, which means imposing certain laws or standards on people. And that can really bristle uh, and, and hit people in a very uh, strong way, in particular in this country. I mean, after all, we fought a war over the ability to live the life that we want to pursue, right? And so there is a cultural ethos here that this, this issue uh, conflicts with. I talked to my colleagues in Europe, you know, they see this in very stark contrast to how negotiations and how things are looked at, how decisions are made. Is it the rights of the individual that are more important than the rights of, of the whole? There's, of course, the issue of threat to meeting basic needs. If the message is to mitigate this problem, that it could destabilize the economy, that's a threat to my ability to make, meet and provide for my family. You know, all of these are losses. From a psychological perspective, you can look at these as perceived loss. Loss of belief, loss of faith, loss of freedom, loss of uh, economic needs. And then, of course, there's a very direct one, which is threats to private sectors. One private sector in particular is going to be very much concerned about mitigating this issue. And that's the one that makes the most money from it, which is the fossil fuel industry. That's easy to understand. If I worked for the fossil fuel industry, I don't think I would be advocating for the elimination of my job. So those are uh, the cultural issues, belief systems, and um, so where we're going here is scientists just always think, well, if I have the right information, I give it to people and I will raise their awareness around this issue. And of course, uh, it's far more complex than that. We have belief systems, we have social norms uh, that affect our values. And those values can be so strongly held that we can neglect, deny, or just ignore the scientific information that's provided. And this is the system that we have to work in. Okay. It's not a bunch of scientists sitting around a table making decisions. Here's a, a, a quantitative analysis of this uh, problem. This is some work that John Cook at Skeptical Science has carried it. I think this is a part of his PhD thesis. He wanted to understand this issue about why only 50% of the public, 50% uh, of the public say that you know there's a tremendous confusion within the scientific community. There's no consensus. And so he used a, a measure of, uh, he calls it free market support. You could think of it as a conservative liberal. You could think of it as, you know, different paradigms for value systems. And the point here is that even for the most liberal-minded people, those who have very little strong support for free markets, even they, that populace, about 64% of them said that, you know, 64% of the scientific community felt that planets warming and hu humans are the cause of it. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, uh, which would be uh, extremely uh, strong support of free market systems, in other words, strong independence, right, right, my independent rights are, supersede those of the, of the whole, then about 30% of people felt that about 30% of the scientific community felt that uh, the planet's warming and humans uh, are doing that, compared to the actual number, which is 97%. So John's essentially saying that for this group, on this end, yes, it is information deficit, okay? That if we could provide the correct information in a way that this group could understand, they would move up here. But for this group, now, this amount of that uh, uh, misunderstanding is due to cultural bias, right? And there's been a lot of research, a lot done by Dan Kahane at Yale and other groups that are looking at uh, 
uh, how value systems affect our ability to take in the science on this issue. And it's a huge factor. Yes, Jean-Francois. Yes? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so uh, value systems. Something you need to be aware of when you're communicating. So what is, what's the implication of this from a com science communication is issue? It basically comes down to this, that you need to know your audience. I mean, every, anybody who's a public speaker knows this fact. Okay, you don't give the same presentation to some a group that's in this has this value system to a group that has this value system. Now that irritates some scientists because they feel like, oh, you're asking me to pervert or you know contort my science so that I can, can you know convey the information to a different group. I'm not asking that. You can convey the same scientific information, but it's in a different way. Okay. You take account of the fact that this audience is coming from a particular perspective or they value certain things over others. And that's, you, you factor that into the presentation that you make. The way you create your slides, the, the information that you use. You know. This group actually has a tremendous interest in history because you know, they look back to the past to understand you know, what we should be preserving and conserving. So you can use history uh, in, with that group more than you would use for that group. What are the psychological dimensions? Well, there are a lot. I, I don't have time to cover all of these, so I'm just going to take one. Affect response and regulation is the one I'm going to focus on mostly. Uh, but there are some really interest, interesting ones, uh, especially in developed countries. Our self-identity and how it's tied to consumption. This is actually a cultural anthropology issue. Um, and so if we reduce, if we're asking people to reduce consumption, that has a direct effect on their, their perception of themselves, how they value themselves. If my self-identity is strongly tied with how much I own, how much I can consume, if you're asking me to change that, you're essentially asking me to change my self-identity. Relatedness to the non-human environment. There's been longitudinal studies for the last 50 years. I mean, the, the last one that was done was in the 70s. Uh, the, uh, you know, 50 years ago, the average American spent two and a half hours in direct connection with nature. The last time that was study was done about 20 years ago, uh, it was 12 minutes. Okay. So uh, now, most of us here in this room, since we can go out back and walk touch a pine tree in a matter of a minute, uh, can't relate to this too much, but we're talking about a lot of people who get up in the morning, get in their car, drive to work, get in their car, drive home, and they really have, don't, do not have direct access to the, the non-human world. And then there are typological character structures. There's some really interesting work on how typology affects uh, communication. Think any, if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs, uh, scientists tend to clump in a particular Myers-Briggs class. Okay, not hard to uh, understand. And yet, if you look at the typology of, say, politicians, exactly the opposite. So if a scientist goes to Congress and sits down with a congressman, typologically they're coming from a 180-degree uh, perspective. And so if you can factor that typological difference into the way you're communicating with that person, by the way, this is how you can bring people together in marriages, work through typological differences, uh, you can actually communicate far better. So understanding the typological character structure of the person you're speaking with has a huge, can play a huge role in whether you're going to get through to that person. So uh, just so let's just end with the affect. Uh, a lot of research again. This is uh, Paul Epstein, a psychologist at Yale. Uh, two ways of perceiving and processing. He says there's no dearth of evidence in everyday life 
the people apprehend reality in two fundamentally different ways. One variously labeled intuitive, automatic, natural, nonverbal, narrative, and experiential, and the other analytical, deliber deliberative, verbal, and rational. Okay, why, do, why is that the case? Think of it, think, think neurology, neuroscience here. Think of the brain, the evolution of the human brain. I mean, that's, that's the evolution of the human brain. The limbic system and the neocortex. Those are the two systems that Paul Epstein's talking about here. And there's no way to deny that. There's no way to get around that. You know, I, I tell people, the scientists who speak to the public on this issue, they want to keep the affect out. And I said, look, the minute you stand up on that podium, the affect's in the room. The minute you say global warming or climate change, the affect is really in the room. Is you cannot get away from it. It's a part of the human system. And then Paul Slovic and colleagues has done tremendous amount of research on how affect plays a role in our ability to take in information and make decisions. Affect has rarely been recognized as an important component in human judgment and decision making, perhaps befitting its rationalistic origins main focus of descriptive decision research has been cognitive rather than affective. And yet, we cannot turn this part of the brain off. Okay? If we did, we'd die. And, or we'd be very boring people. <laughs> so, I, the reason I asked you how are you feeling after I presented you with this information is here they are. Fear, numbness, defiance, helplessness, anger, powerless, guilt. These are all emotions that arise when you give a presentation on climate change. When you're sitting in an airport waiting for your plane and the person beside you asks you, what do you do? And you start talking to them about, well, the climate's changing and all of this stuff's starting to come up. Okay. Uh, and, and interestingly, if you pull off a shelf a textbook on trauma, these are all signatures of trauma. So we are in the unfortunate situation where we are traumatizing the public by providing this information. Okay? And there's no getting around it. Unless you watered your, your science down to the point where it just says nothing. Okay? And I think this is where Naomi is coming from and Matt Mario. You know, they're essentially saying that perhaps we scientists are actually trying to avoid this and we're downplaying the risks involved in climate change. That would be an interesting study. I mean, that's where what the research that Naomi is actually carrying out right now. And she's claiming we are doing this. We are trying to essentially avoid these reactions. But we can't. I mean, this is a human nature. So, uh, how do you break through this? First of all, you don't, you're not going to eliminate it. And, you know, I've often asked, how do I work with this? Uh, I actually allocate about 20 minutes of my presentation time to give people a voice in how they're feeling. And I don't try to uh, alleviate their feelings. I don't try to uh, do therapy on them. Uh, I just listen. And everybody in the room is listening to everybody else. Okay, and there's a tremendous power to the people having a voice in how they're feeling. I gave a talk a year ago out at uh, the University in California. And a woman stood up and said, this is the first time I've actually been able to tell people how I feel about this. That I, was, I thought I was the only person that felt this way about this issue. Helpless. So that, that, there's a healing actually in that. And that's a part of how we process this stuff, right? So here are just some, these are, none of these are um, my ideas. I mean, if there's a tremendous excitement. If you go to an AGU conference now, think of all the sessions that are on science communication. You know, and I've been going to AGU sessions for, 35 years. And I can assure you, 35 years ago, there wasn't one session on climate communication. You know, it's only in the last 10 years where this has just exploded. And 
or AMS, uh, you know, the science organizations are actually paying very serious attention to these issues and how we can uh, improve our ability to communicate. So construct narratives rich in images. Why do I say that? Because that's the way the human brain works. We are called the storytelling animal. And there's a lot of evolutionary uh, research around why we are so effective storytellers. It gives us, actually, there's an, a, an advantage, an evolutionary advantage to being able to be storytelling animals. And why images? Because that older part of the brain reacts far faster to images than it does, the, the neocortex does to words. So, you know, that old picture is worth a thousand wor words. That's exactly true. And it's based on, you can uh, confirm that through neuroscience or research. Recognize the importance of the felt sense of experience. Don't talk in abstract concepts. I showed you a lot of plots at the beginning of this. I would never show as many plots to the public. I would use other types of images. Uh, but most of you are so very well educated and scientists. And so I knew I could get away with showing you some bar charts and line ch charts. You know, things like the bank account. That's a tremendous uh, narrative to use. Everybody has a bank account. And you can even use it now to explain the hiatus. Uh, if you have a checking account and a savings account, and let's us make the magical assumption that every year your income increases by a certain percentage. Um, then uh, what are you going to do with that money? Well, if I just had a checking account, I'd just put it in a checking account. I have expenditures, but let's assume they're fixed. What, what if I have a savings account? Then I have the choice. I can put, maybe for a few years, I'll put less in savings and more, less in checking and more in savings. Now, if I just looked at my savings, I would say that my savings has slowed down or, or even stalled. But that's not my total value, the monetary value. If I include the, the deeper part, the savings, then I see a monotonic increase in my wealth, monetary wealth. So, you know, this is, what's ha this is what the climate system is doing. The energy that's going into the system isn't going into the savings account. Some of, more of it's going into the, uh, more is going into the savings and the checking account. Make climate scientists real people, okay? We, we have this tendency to take the, put on a persona of, you know, the, it's not as bad as putting a lab coat on, but it can get close to that. And you, I you know, encourage you to talk about what got you into the science, why you're uh, looking at the problem you're looking at. You know, that close to 10 years that I did uh, paleo research, what's that tied to? I can definitively say that's tied to the fact that I grew up in Pennsylvania. Coal mining is big in Pennsylvania. And when those guys dig those coal mines, they just dump the slag on a huge hill. And you can go out on those things and find the most beautiful fossils. I filled my entire parents' entire basement with fossils. You couldn't even walk on the floor. And so, you know, that's a connection. That's a connection to me as a scientist of why I'm interested in this. Use stories relating the history of the discovery. I've given you an example of that with John Tyndall. You can use Earth's history as a means to connect to warm worlds of the past. And then that, you know, convey that models are useful tools. And finally, offer a sense of solutions. A lot of this hopelessness and helplessness is that there's no solution to this problem. And yet, there are more and more solutions people are coming up with year after year. And so it's not a hopeless problem. It's not... Uh, there are solutions that you can focus on. So what I'm proposing is that rather than going using this old model of we take observations, we have our theories and models, and we just give that information to the public to raise to raise their awareness, that we have this whole layer in between where we have to develop rich narratives that include images and metaphors that factor in our audience's value systems. In essence, this is what in communication theory is called framing. So become good framers. Okay. 
And uh, I'll, let me just leave it here. I think that's it. Uh, you know, present the things that we really understood stand well. As scientists, we have a tendency to talk about all the things we don't understand first. That's a very bad thing to do with the public. Uh, recognize the psychological process, the affects in the room. You got to work with it. Carefully find the right images that are going to work for the message that you're going to convey. And leave the audience with a feeling of options and opportunities. Thank you very much. If people have questions, we just need to use the microphone. So Natalie and I have those. So questions? Yeah, it was a great talk. It was really interesting. Thank you. Sure. Um, my question is, um, I think that a lot of studies now show that uh, when people are told something that goes against their value system, they have a tendency to dig in yes. even more. Yes. Um, and so my question really is, you know, how much do we really need to convince people that climate change is real? And how much can we just do an end run around that? and get them doing the right things mm -hmm. without having to convince them that things are real first? Uh, I, I, you know, I, my naive stage, I would have said you've got to convince them. I think we are at a critical point in the evolution of this planet. Uh, I truly do believe that this is the greatest crisis human civilization has ever faced, and it's imperative that we address it. And so if someone wants to reduce carbon emissions because of national security or because of it's good for their personal bank account, uh, I'm all for it. Okay. Now the other uh, thing that I didn't mention here, which is very well recognized, is the messenger issue. Uh, for example, last year I was on a panel with Bob Inglis, who is a, a conservative Republican. And Bob is completely accepts the science of climate change. He completely rejects the science of evolution. I don't care about that. And, and Bob is going to his constituents, his fellow conservatives, and arguing that we have to do something about this because of, for the economy. Okay, he's not trying to convince them that the, about the science. He's arguing this is an economic issue. And if he can do that, more power to him. I don't, you know, I really have taken a very practical approach to this. That uh, if someone accepts that we have to do something and they don't accept the science, well, you know, that's okay. I'm not going to try to convince them otherwise. Because, as you say, the value system will overrule my uh, opinions, according to them, their opinions. Yes, Kevin. Hey, hey uh, Jeff. Um, it's certainly very easy to, to get people depressed and scared about this issue, but it's also fairly easy to convert that into anger and outrage. And, and that uh, is a more logical step towards um, actions and, and things to be done. One of the things you didn't deal with was what is the consequences of this? What are the actual prediction, predictions and, wh and where the pressure points in society uh, really occur? And, and one of the options then also is to deal with uh, scenarios, high scenarios and low scenarios, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what uh, actions that people might take could actually do to get you from a high scenario to, to a low scenario. And of course, there's some depressing parts of that too, because the main actions you take today actually have benefits about 30 or 40 years from now, but they can make a big difference uh, 50 and, and 100 years from now. And so that's one of the things which uh, which is certainly worth dealing with. So that deals with the mitigation side of things. But then the other side of it is the adaptation, which is recognizing the kinds of changes we expect to see and planning for the consequences. And so that's another aspect where you can do a lot uh, that, um, that uh, people, I, I find, respond to discuss, but I'm glad you asked it. You know, what do I tell people? If you look at the Greek word crisis, the root of that word, it's a term from a legal system. And it means decision, a decision point. Okay. And of course, the Chinese word for crisis is strongly tied to opportunity. And I really feel that that's the way we should look at this problem. 
we can take this situation as an opportunity to create a far better world than the one we have now. And so uh, I have been essentially promoting or discussing how we can take this and change and essentially transform society so that it becomes a far better world to live in. And it's really up to us to make that decision. And that uh, there are very great thinkers and, and uh, engineers that are working on ways to actually accomplish that. So rather than uh, getting depressed and or even angry, uh, because anger, in, in the end, I think anger is a very destructive emotion. Uh, you're either angry at yourself or you're so angry at somebody else that you can't uh, cooperate. That the path that I'm pursuing with colleagues and, and in my presentations is let's create a flourishing future. Not, you know, I even avoid the word sustainable because sustain, what are we going to sustain? Are we going to, you know, you know, there's a myth that the, the, the leading myth in our culture is growth, perpetual growth. Okay, it's deeply embedded in us. This is the narrative that affects us, you know. And it's been around for a long time, and it's a myth that, that can no longer work. It's based at least on one premise, which has now burned itself out, and that is it's based on infinite resources. And that there are no infinite resources. So how do we create a flourishing world? For as many people as possible, as many beings as possible on this planet, not just humans. So, uh, actually, that's what I talk about. And that tends to resonate with people. Uh, it, it's a, it really gives them a sense that uh, of empowerment. And if they certainly have children or they're concerned about future generations, it opens them up to... to uh, playing a part, actively participating in designing a world that's going to be better than the one that we have now. Now, if you're a cynic or a quote-unquote realist, you'll reject all of that. Uh, but I'm frankly tired of going out and giving talks and leaving people with a sense that this is a problem that has no solution. I actually think it is has a solution, and the greatest tragedy in history will be if we choose not to create that world. Okay, we'll take one last question and um, we'll have to make this one a quick one because we're over on time. Jeff, thank you. I, I actually was going to quibble with you if you hadn't mentioned the opportunity piece. So yeah. my name is Brett Kincaren. I'm the city's uh, senior environmental planner working on climate change. Welcome. Thank you. And I think the way we are talking about reframing our work is to make it about climate wealth, well-being, and security. And that the other thing I would want to challenge just a slight amount in your talk is that the premise that we can't do anything ourselves, that it's a collective issue. I totally agree that there are large system changes that have to take place. And I, and I don't agree with that. I, I don't agree with what I said. You know? okay. I, I, <laughs> let me clarify. I think it's going to take more than us acting as individuals, but I act. I encourage individuals to do everything they can, because it, it again, there's an empowerment to that. They're participating. You know, it's it's public participation, uh, and it does have an effect. Well, and it and it creates the template for the change yes, that we exactly. then created a larger system. Exactly. So I just leave with this that. We're working on a framework that provides every person the opportunity to essentially create their own climate action plan. Uh -huh. Because every one of us, because we know that the, the primary problem is energy. Right. And therefore, the primary solution is that every one of us, at every level, need to change our energy systems. Now, for many of us, that's going to be difficult to make it an immediate change. But if we see ourselves as a part of a transition that's going to take 10 or 15 years, and we look at the next time I buy a car, the next time I replace my furnace, yeah. the next time I buy anything that's using energy, or think about how I'm producing my energy, and I make the investment instead of something that's taking me in the wrong direction, 
something that's taking me in the right direction. Where I'm headed is that world you're talking about, yes. a world of opportunity, a world of freedom, a world of much higher quality than we have right now. You know, a lot of this is about imagination, something that gets uh, downplayed, but I think is a critical part of any a society and education, that we have to imagine that world, and then we have to make it creative. That's, you know, it really is that simple. Marta, could Marta have a I joke sometimes that I'm Jeff's publicist because he's such a humble guy. <laughs> I just want to put in a plug that um, next Thursday um, at, at <laughs> 5, um, Jeff and also Jane McMahon, who's an artist, are going to be speaking upstairs in the Damon room um, in, um, along with an exhibit of Jane's photographs that are about the hydrologic cycle um, in relationship to climate change. So, if, And there will be refreshments. So if any of you are out and about next Thursday at 5 o'clock, there will be a, um, a, a conversation about art and science and climate change and psychology. Thanks. So let me, I'm going to take the last word. I always like to say this at the end of these presentations. You know that you are all messengers, right? And it doesn't, you don't have to be invited to give a talk like this to get the message out. You can get the message out at a coffee house, at an airport, on a bus, you know. That's, I think, our civic responsibility because we have carried this information and we hopefully care enough that we become the communicators. Every one of you is a communicator. And it's really, I'll even be stronger, it's your ethical responsibility to communicate this to as many people as you can. Even that cantankerous uncle at Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.